soon found out I was losing my mind Seemed like the real thing I was so blind Much mistrust, love gone So confusing, there's no peace of mind. If I fear I'm losing you, it's just no good. You tease him like a dove. Welcome to Musicians. I'm David Wilde, and more importantly, this is Deborah Harry and Chris Stein of Blondie. That was great. Have Thank you, you so it. much. <laughs> um, I have to admit, I'm a little bit nervous uh, for this show because this is the first guest of Musicians whose poster used to hang in my room and I used to gaze upon longingly. I'm speaking, of course, of Mr. Chris Stein. Was that good for you? Uh, <laughs> no, no, it was, uh, it was you, Deborah. But the reason I'm thrilled to have you on the show is that uh, beyond the posters, I eventually started looking at the actual albums, when there were actual albums, and I would look at the songs that I loved, and I noticed inevitably they were written by uh, Harry and Stein, that beyond the posters there was really, there were great musicians, so we get to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, there were musicians in the group. <laughs> your voice. Let's talk about your voice for a minute. Uh, I mean, everyone here wasn't at Soundcheck, but everyone was talking about your voice just keeps getting better and better. Uh, you, you, Chris, write, have been writing for that voice for many years. What's it like to write for a voice like that, and how do you as a writer well, that, work? Well, that kind of makes it easier, because I do hear her singing stuff and I'm working on it and it pulls it into a certain place I guess because yeah I mean I, I have to align whatever I'm doing to what it's going to sound like just physically or singing it so that that puts a I don't know if it's constraints as such but it 
gives it a kind of area to work in. And because she'll be too humble, what is her strength as a vocalist? Well, it's, you know, her, Debbie has, um, there's a school of aesthetic realism which says that all good art is the combination of opposites. So cer certainly Debbie is, uh, she, you know, her, her vocal qualities have this sort of um, knowing sexuality on top of this innocence that's going on. So it wasn't my time. fault I was excited all those years. It was, yeah, uh, yeah, it was yeah. intentional. It, it was there. I don't know if it's intentional or not. It's just how it comes out. What singers were you listening to that helped you find your own voice? Who did you imitate before you found Everybody. your own voice? Any, any ones that come to mind? Though, any big influences early on? No, I, I can't really say that there was one thing because I never, I never bought records. I only listened to the radio. And um, I started listening to the radio very young. And there was a lot of stuff then. And there were tiny little local gospel stations late at night. There was, you know, the hit parade. No, I don't think there was top 10 even then. I think it was sort of just the hit parade kind of stuff. I didn't even know if there was top 10. But, um, you know, I started listening very young and that was really, I know that that's what really shaped me. Do you think that also shaped Blondie a little bit in that, you know, especially by the time you got to a record like Auto American, it was so all over the place in a great way about being open to bringing in, you know, sort of island influences and, you know, hip hop. Do you think you've always had that kind of hit parade, uh, you know, spirit in your music? Well, that's one of the, I think that's, that's what sort of, you know, Chris and I have in common was that we had, uh, you know, a lot of different references and, and we're very sort of metropolitan about, you know, our, our music. And um, it could also be, you know, said that we're indecisive. <laughs> I, you know, but I, musicians I, who can't commit, <laughs> right? Can't get yeah, right. Just keep, you know, trying everything. Tell me about uh, the song you just performed. Obviously, Heart of Glass, uh, a classic. What would you say that Heart of Glass did for your career? What kind of impact did that one song have? Well, it, it, most people forget is that it was on the charts. The album, that Paralines album, was on the charts for six months in America before that song went to number one, and that was a big deal, and it got Joey Ramone to say we sold out was the <laughs> biggest, you know, influence it had on me at the time. Was that a real, uh, was it a tough time for you when you became the sort of first punk act to have a number one hit? Was the backlash at all difficult for you? Well, I don't know if it was particularly difficult. I think that <clears throat> there was some, you know, bones of contention within the band about, you know, losing our, our code of ethics, so to speak, or, you know being real um, I think and and some some people really had been you know pummeled to death by disco and couldn't get their music on the radio so when we sort of did this crossover thing I mean crossover really wasn't a big thing then crossover really sort of hadn't happened and this was a crossover Blondie really was at the forefront of some really a lot of the major changes in music in recent history uh, Heart of Glass was the first sort of you know, rock, pop act, crossing over to disco. Uh, Rapture is incredibly groundbreaking in terms of bringing rap. Uh, I think the Beastie Boys were still little boys at the time of uh, Rapture. That was really groundbreaking. And of course, the original one, Punk. Do you have any explanation uh, how you were able to sort of do things first? Uh, even if you haven't always gotten credit for it, how do you explain your sort of ability to uh, be out there that way? Well, the one formula I had was looking around and seeing what was going on and then doing something that wasn't happening. So in that respect, but it wasn't really f formularized at all. And that's probably why it was what it was. Well, well you know, they say um, the, the ones that come first get rocks thrown at them and the ones that come second get flowers thrown at them. You know that deal. So we certainly underwent that. I want to go to another song. That uh, Heart of Glass comes from one of my favorite records of all time, uh, Parallel Lines. Uh, but that album had, was full of amazing songs. There's another one uh, that's always meant a lot to me, uh, Sunday Girl. Uh, I wonder if you can, first of all, tell me there is a Sunday man, or there was a Sunday man. Tell me who Sunday man was. Sunday man was Debbie's cat. And, and when we came back from tour one time, he had been staying with her sister, and the sister, her sister Martha called up and said that he had run away, and it was very sad. He later was seen, we thought, but we were, 
<laughs> but we've never been able to verify that. With Elvis, I heard. Yeah. Dancing at the garage, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and who was Sunday Girl? Sunday Girl is just, you know, it's the yearning of uh, youth trying to get out of itself. It's just a standard thing, and I thought a little... And then I, there's a vague reference to Georgie Girl, even though it's not really that, you know, apparent. It doesn't make any sense, but it's kind of there. Can you just show me a little bit how you came up Sunday with the Girl. Sunday Girl? Sunday Girl, I will go up if I try to play. <laughs> That's part of the show. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it's like an, it's a Calypso song, really. It's like a afro Caribe song, which is, and the original demo was much more in that vein, and the melody's like that. And sometime, if I ever get enough interest, I would like to do a, like a more Calypso version of it. And tell me, how did it go from there? You get, you, is that how it starts with that? And then yeah, the how does it become the, the song? The riff was the main thing, was that. And I probably had that with that before I even put them into the chords. And then I put the chords underneath, and then I had to figure out a chorus, and somehow the chorus came out really pleasing. You know, it was, it was simple. That was in my real primitive days. And, then, and I wrote that on the guitar. Now I don't do much writing on guitars, which may have screwed me up in the long run. I can't tell. Will you just sing the two of you just like 30 seconds of it? Because it's, it's my favorite. It's a sort of host-insisted uh, request. Still as sweet. Dry your eyes, Sunday girl. Hey, I saw your guy with a different girl. It looks like he's in another world. Run and hide, Sunday girl. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> As songwriters, uh, you know, again, people sort of, I think, sometimes forget because there was so much emphasis on image that people sort of thought maybe he was a Svengali giving you the material. But there was a real collaboration here, and I have the sense it was kind of like that Lennon-McCartney thing of you filled each other's sort of weak points. Can you describe how you tended to work, uh, you know, what was the process like between the two of you? There we had, there was a lot of intuitive stuff that goes on whereby Debbie certainly would understand things I meant just by grunts and groans and like that, you know, I would, it, sometimes I wouldn't verbalize something and she would intuitively know what I was talking about. So we were on the same page, so to speak, when, with a, we had our, I don't know if we had a private musical language, but it, it was there between us. What do you respect about Chris as a craftsman and as a songwriter? Well, it's very easy to, uh to put lyrics to Chris's songs because they're all so moody. They all have such a life of their own. They, they really speak. You know, they have this real sort of picture. You can en envision stuff and it, you can really hear the moods. And, and, and I, don't, I don't know, beyond that, that's sort of how I, how I relate to it. What drew you each to this downtown New York scene that, you know, it's sort of this world of misfits that became, you know, a cultural force and changed the world, and I would include you in that group. How did you get into that New York scene? I think what um, I really sort of set me off about it was, uh, you know, early folk music and beatniks. The idea of being a beatnik artist really was, that was it for me. I, I got to be a beatnik artist. and. Uh, when I was old enough, I just moved into the city. It's really what I wanted to do. What brought you uh, from, was it Brooklyn? Yeah. From Brooklyn, you had to make the long trip uh, yeah. to Greenwich Village. Yeah. Uh, how did that happen? I, I you know, grew up with the radio, I remember, but I was uh, very influenced by folk music. And I used to listen to WBAI, and it was really heavily influenced. I was probably much more into Dylan before I was in the Beatles, but that's something finally... Something finally clicked for me with the Beatles, and I really liked it, you know, very early on. And all, all the stuff, and again, my, my 
had paralleled the rise of all these groups as they first came about. I feel like really lucky that I was born in 1950 and I got to see all this stuff. And before rock and roll, I was listening to movie music, though. You know, maybe it goes back to my mother singing La Strada. I don't know. And um, then I started making forays into New York, and then I, I, I found myself in the School of Visual Arts in the early 70s, and there used to be flyers in the lobby for this thing called the New York Dolls, and I thought it was a drag act. So I, I never... I, and you were wrong? Yeah, more or less, I guess. I never went to see it, but then I, some, then I saw something in the Village Voice saying that it was a great rock band and the singer looked like Mick Jagger and da-da-da. So I went to see them, and opening for them was this guy, Eric Emerson, who had a... I was more... I had more affinity to what he was doing, and I wound up being a roadie for him and playing with these guys, and then along about roundabout way, that's how I ran into Debbie. Well, Deborah, I want your, uh, your version, since it can get Rashomon-like with these things, uh, your version of how you first met, met Chris and uh, what kind of impression he made. Oh, I, I met him at a show. He came to a show. I was in a little trio, um, sort of a cabaret kind of act, the stilettos, and uh, Chris was in the audience. And um, <laughs> for some, because of the way the lighting was, he was sort of backlit, and I couldn't really see his face. But I don't know. Uh, something about the his. I don't know, the way he was just sort of his posture or something, I, I he really... He has great posture, I should say. I, I, uh, I, I had to, you know, I had sort of, I was very shy and I, 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 I couldn't look at anybody in the audience, you know, I had no stage presence whatsoever. And um, so I could only look at him. And so I just looked at him for the whole show. I don't, did you know that? No, I'm still not sure if it's true. I, but... Well, I mean, I could look to the side. I could look to that side, but I couldn't really look at the, you know, well, okay. look around. I, I guess I'll... Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But, no, I mean, I, so Debbie's appeal, it was later obvious to a lot of people, seemed to be, to be, you know, glaringly obvious then, even though she had short, dark hair and all this stuff. So I, I thought she was really terrific and had a tremendous presence, etc. So that was it. I just thought she was really great. So I was friends with one of the girls in stilettos, and I gradually started playing with them, and that's it. The rest is history. I'm sitting here destroyed. Are you telling me she's not a natural blonde? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Chris, tell me your very first memory of music. My, I, uh, my father was a really sweet, nurturing guy, and my mother's a little nuts. And uh, my mother actually did think of herself as... Uh, she somehow identified with the character in La Strada, of, you know, there's this poor little waif being brutalized by Anthony Quinn. So um, she used to actually sing the song from La Strada very nicely, so I had that in my head. I, my, I don't know if that goes that far back. It probably, it's a, it's a difficult one. Aside from that, I don't know. I think parades always, you know, kids, little kids always hear like parade music when they're quite young because your parents always take you to see the parade. What would be the first concert you ever went to? Oh, I don't even know. Oh, probably. I probably didn't go to concerts until really kind of late, probably the Fillmore, Fillmore East. Any idea who was your first show? I saw the, this project at the, the Sing-In for Peace at Carnegie Hall, and that was in 1965. And then at the end of that, when people were leaving, the crowd parted, and there was Andy Warhol with his silver hair and sunglasses and, you know, a leather jacket on. And he was, like, from another age entirely back then in this primitive period. And it, that always <laughs> stuck with me. Looking for your face where it could never be. I'm following a trail that only I can see Raising waves of heat, I press on In tiny bursts of speed Named in my pursuit, I pay the fetishist admission The longing that I feel drives me mad with no direction Nailed by something cute, I tear it out with microsurgical precision Incendiary 
Drop some gas on the ember Lightning goes to ground In sender Crazy fool on a bender Striking the ground of face igniting and familiar pulls me by the eye to the perimeter riveting my gaze is that your face in the crowd in sender drop some gas on the ember lightning goes to ground in sender as if a slap in the face striking the ground That was beautiful. Uh, Thanks. Deborah, what is all this about no stage presence? Because I always thought you were sort of a uh, kind of groundbreaking front woman because you had beauty and attitude, which is a you know, very potent combination and very rock and roll. Do you feel like you didn't have stage presence at the beginning and you got it along the way? And how, how do you do that? How do you learn that skill? I guess it's just, uh, Pain you and know, suffering. Yeah, <laughs> developing, you know. You, at first, I really thought, you know, I would go out on stage and I would be sort of petrified and you know, but driven anyway, you know, obsessed with this sort of thing. And, um, you know, of course, the music is very exciting, you know, and you, you just, you know, can react to that. But then I noticed that, you know, I expected, what finally dawned on me was that I really expected the audience to make it happen for me. <laughs> Silly me. And, um, then I sort of came to the conclusion that regardless of what was happening in front of me, that I didn't care, you know, that I had to have this experience and, you know, that's how I, that's how I approached it. And when that happened, then the audience really responded to me. And talk about what do you see when you were, you know, arena days looking at the crowd? What did you see? Uh, you know, do you see the crowd, do you take it all in? Do you just focus in on the first row? Do you realize it's all guys like me with the mouse open? You know, what, what are you seeing from the stage? Um, well, I guess um, at first, you know, you sort of are dealing with, uh, you know, the crush zone, you know, the diehard fans, and, you know, they're always great. They always make you feel great. And, um, 
either that or in the early days they used to spit on us. I mean, but that was, you know, that, that was, was that was a sign of affection. Too. Yeah. Exactly. People were very supportive in that because the scene was so small, it was just so private and so, you know, personal that you know, people just considered it their own. You know, and it, that was really sort of nice about it. It was very supportive in a small way, and it sort of allowed us to to develop and to experiment. And um, and I think that. You know, many times that really is a, a great thing that can happen for a group. You know, besides you, I guess my favorite group would be the Ramones of that sort of scene. Musically, there was a lot of similarity. Playing with sort of trashy pop, you know, uh, sounds and then making them really something new and giving them a new energy. Did you feel a connection with the Ramones? Well, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I just adored I, them. Yeah, I, was, we were, I think we were kind of awed by the Ramones. Yeah. I, I really thought, I thought the Ramones were much better than we were initially because they really had their whole... We developed our act over a period of time, and it still is, you know, based on a lot of the collecticism. But the Ramones really were solid when they came in, even when it was still very ragged and they weren't, you know, as tight. They, the vision of it was always right there. Yeah, and they always had a certain degree of professionalism, and I, I know that people will find that hard to believe. I mean, they just knew about how to do their show, you know, how to promote themselves. They were really... Just, just, just smart about it. They really knew about the business. They were smart about that, but I think Blondie probably set, uh, you know, the record in terms of uh, imagery and the use of imagery and it, the power of using imagery. How do you feel about having sort of played around with that uh, Marilyn Monroe, Madonna whore uh, iconography way ahead of Madonna? Is there a sense of pride in that, and how much planning went into it? Well, I think fortunately for me, it was the time of you know women's lib. And I wasn't really ready to be Helen ready. But I loved all the R&B songs, and I loved all, you know, like the blues singers, and I thought that they were, you know, they were a great influence. Um, but I didn't really want to approach it like that. I wanted it to be a more defiant and more independent vision of, of a woman. And that's basically it. And how did it feel to see, I think you had to notice a lot of it was sort of, reflected, and I hope uh, you got a thank you note from Madonna at some point, uh, but to see it sort of uh, reemerge in, in a new way and with a new spin, but how did that feel for you? We are, you know, we're not like really major stars on a certain, you know, I mean, yeah, you go ho ho, but it's true, you know, we're in a sort of B world, this nebulous limbo of, you know, almost making it, which is probably okay, you know, when we're comfortable and we get to do what we want, but then on the other hand, you know, like I just, you know, you two just bought half of Ireland or something like that. <laughs> and, I, and as far as the rock and roll community thing goes, you know, the corporatizing of music is probably more ferociously there than it ever was. Uh, everything has come full cycle so many ways. And I always ask myself now, if I was a kid, would I want to be doing this? You know, because it's not dangerous and mysterious anymore. This is something I've said in a million interviews. I think that that's one of the reasons why rap became so vastly successful and so big, and um, it's because it had that element of, of danger and forbidden, forbiddenness. You know, that that early rock and roll had really had. It, it was just such a magnet for, you know, kids because you know they just want to do something different, you know, and break away. You bring up uh, rap. Now, uh, Auto American, uh, you know, another major, major album for Blondie. Uh, and Mike Chapman, your producer, has a story where, you know, you kept talking about you wanted to do this rap thing, and he didn't even know what that meant. Uh, what do you remember of how that, you know, really sort of historic rap uh, got on that record? I, I, the thing that bothered me about it was that I wanted to make it better and Mike was just so happy that we had it at all <laughs> it just stayed that way you know and I, I sort of I sort of regret that in a way because the phrasing is so you know it's well, like it's old you, school yeah it's really <laughs> can you just give us a little of the rap now you can now show us how you've uh, uh, you know perfected it because <laughs> I, I think it's important to you yeah. <laughs> Mm. Okay. <laughs> do you want to do it? You want me to play it? No. I'm really? not going to say it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why not? It's okay. on you, Jack. 
Oh. Fab Five Freddy. Fab Five Freddy told me everybody's fly, DJ spinning. I said, my, my, flash is fast, flash is cool. Francois said, pas, flash ain't no do. And you don't stop. Sure shot. Go out to the parking lot. Get in your car. You drive real far. Drive all night till you see a light. Comes right down, lands on the ground, and out comes the man from Mars. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, God. Let's hear a song from the No Exit record, Night Wind Scent. Okay. This is like, uh, what? No, I right, can't. This is. This, it used to be like this at CBGB's, like really quiet. <laughs> Go on. No, it was. It, it was a period. It reminds me of this. Yeah, the only time it was quiet at CBGB's was at the end of the night when everybody was so drunk. <laughs> it was... <laughs> okay. Since this is a show called Musicians, yeah, it's a good tell me oh, yeah. about the musician. Oh, yeah. Paul one, Carbonara. That one over there. That's Paul Carbonara. Paul Carbonara. Oh. He's got a great attitude and he plays really nicely and um, he can. He's a very diversified player. Yeah, he's really easy to get along with. Yeah, unlike. And he laughs at all our jokes. Yeah, right. Even if yeah, he's they're a really not good there. audience too. Yeah. yeah. That's the key to the gig. Uh, uh, <laughs> talk about. Having a band that's formed around a, a couple uh, is a unique dynamic, and I imagine a difficult one. Uh, what's it like when you have a voting block of two 
and you try to form a musical unit around it. How does that work with a band? Well, I think bands have to be a monarchy at, at worst or a dictatorship. I mean, you can't have a democratic thing. I mean, just nothing will ever get done, unless maybe if you have an odd number of people. But when it, it's just impossible. If everybody gets to say, especially with musicians or people who are of an artistic bent, just, just forget about it. It's just not going to happen. So somebody has to be calling the shots. As I understand it, uh, I think you've said before that the band exploded and then you sort of physically exploded. Did Blondie break up at all because you got sick? Or did well, you get sick because Yeah, I got Blondie sick because of all the, the tensions and anger that I had inside me over everything that was going on. Because we were, I mean, it's only much later that I realized how badly we got screwed. But even at the time, I think there was a sense of that. Because we, the people we were dealing with early on in the music business were not like the way things are now, where there are a lot of younger people in the industry and there's a, an attempt to actually be honest and forthright. You, you know, it may just be an attempt, but at least that's there. We were deal dealing with this brill building mentality, if right. people know what that is. You know, it's the old uh, surf, you know, type thing. Well, we were very idealistic and we had um, no business sense or, you know, experience. And, um, none of us came from showbiz families, so we had no, I mean, I think that that helps a lot. Yeah. And we had, uh, I don't know, how many different managers did we have? We just sort of like kept changing managers, and it was just a big, you know, goof from the beginning. I mean, it was just, I was sort of doomed business-wise. If you could explain <coughs> what disease... Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Choking. Um... I had this thing called Pamphagus vulgaris, which is, Pamphagus is Latin for blisters. And I did spend th I was three months in this one little room, and, and I had amazing astral uh, visions and all kinds of stuff that are tied into it. So I, I can't say that I really regret it, but then I also, I mean, my, my personal psychology is one of, you know, feeling safe with them in bed being taken care of. So uh, <coughs> that's like Excuse a lot me. of people like that. Stop coughing. I can't help it. <coughs> I'm choking. Who yeah. was it who took care of you? Uh... Gabby took care of me. Um, I, and why we stopped living together and being, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's hard to keep a relationship going under any circumstances. And did you think you might lose him? Was it, how serious a... Uh... I was told that he was going to die. And how did you handle that? Not very well. <laughs> I, you know, it was really awful. And did he make it? I don't know. <laughs>
in, in the long run, who knows? Is it just going to be? I mean, even Beethoven, all those guys, you know, in another hundred years, who will know? You know, who knows? Well, it's, it's really a thrill, and it's very satisfying when you, you know, you write something that <clears throat> really, you know, holds together and, and really, you know, makes sense for you. And, and uh, I mean, on this on this new album, I wrote some lyrics that, I mean, for some reason, at, at my age, I wrote a song that's about coming of age, and it's so complete. I mean, it's just really was so complete for me emotionally, lyric, uh, all the, you know, sort of phrasing, everything just worked out just so beautifully. It was really satisfying. Well, now let's hear a song that many of us uh, came of age to. Uh, let's hear one way or another. <laughs> and thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Are you okay? You're still choking? I'm still choking. <laughs> no, I'm okay. <clears throat> Remember it? <laughs> One way or another, I'm gonna find ya. I'm gonna get you, get you, get you, get you one way or another. I'm gonna win ya. I'll get you, I'll get you one day, maybe next week. I'm gonna see ya. I'll meet you, meet you, meet you, meet you one way or another. I'm gonna see ya. I'll meet you, yeah, yeah. I will drive past your house and if the lights are all down I'll see who's around One way or another I'm gonna find ya I'm gonna get you, get you, get you, get you One way or another I'm gonna see ya I'll meet you, meet you, meet you, meet you One day, baby, maybe next week I'm gonna see ya I'll meet you, meet you, meet you, meet you One way, baby, or another I'm gonna see. You know I will and if the lights are all out, I'll follow your bus downtown. See who's hanging. Tricky, 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 one way, baby, or another. I'm gonna lose you. I'm gonna give you the slip. I walk down the mall, stand over by the wall where I can see it all. I'll find out who you call. I'm gonna lead you to the supermarket. We'll check out some specials and some rat food. Yeah, see, I know where you work. I know where you park your car. I know your license plate number. I know your phone number. I know your phone number at work. I even know your social security number. One way, baby. Hey, one way, baby. I'm gonna find you. I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you. Get you. One way, baby. One way, baby. Another. I'm gonna see ya. I'm gonna see ya. I'm gonna meet ya. Oh, one way, baby. Yeah, one way, baby. Walk down the wall, stand over by the wall. I'm gonna find out who you call. Supermarket, yeah. One way, baby. One way, baby, or another. I wanna see ya. I meet ya. Gonna get ya. Gonna get ya. Gonna get ya. One way, baby. One way. 